To call him odd is perhaps um, wrong, but unusual, certainly. Um, and he had one of the first things you saw with these enormous fingers with these extraordinary um, stripings on his fingernails. I really don't know what caused that. But the great point was that at any rate, with me and my friends, he was so very lively, so very amusing. And his ideas were always bubbling about. Um, what about? Certainly about mathematics, because I was a fellow mathematician. But um, culture in general. I mean, he used to lend me books. And he certainly expected you to be able to read foreign languages. He lent me a book by Gide in French, and then a mathematics book in German. These are pretty high standards, I think, were expected. While Turing was in retreat at King's, computer engineering was moving ahead elsewhere, in the United States and in Britain. Manchester University, where anyone who urgently wishes to know whether 2 to the power of 127 minus 1 is a prime number or not, can be given the answer by an electronic brain in 25 minutes instead of by a human brain in six months. Setting the machine for this kind of problem takes a week. Then the brain is switched on and impulses passing to the computer make the actual calculation. By 1948, a team of engineers in Manchester had got a small digital computer up and running based on Turing's ideas. It was limited in memory and power, but Turing was very keen to see what it could do. He took up a research post at Manchester University and began writing experimental programs. He developed his ideas about the similarities between minds and machines, and in 1950 he published a prophetic essay I propose to consider the question, can machines think? This should begin with definitions of the meaning of the terms machine and think. The definitions might be framed so as to reflect as far as possible the normal use of the words, but this attitude is dangerous. What Turing's argument suggests is that the things that it should be possible to compute with neurons in the brain are exactly the same things that it should be possible to compute with, say, transistors inside a computer. And that's kind of a scary thought because it suggests that you and I are able, uh, that, that we're machines somehow, or at least what we're able to ever think is somehow the same set of things that a computer could think. And a lot of people find that a very threatening thought because it suggests, since, uh, it suggests that somehow maybe they're not so worthwhile if they're just a computer. I mean, we're used to computers. Computers are dumb machines. Uh, we know that they don't. They're not valuable in the sense that people are valuable. And so somehow people find it very insulting, the notion that they're a machine. And yet Turing's argument is that what you can compute doesn't matter what you're built out of. That's, uh, that's the essence of it. And so it doesn't really matter that we're built of biological components. What we can compute is the same as what a transistor computer could compute. Turing went on to suggest a game or test. Could a judge asking questions over a teletype link decide whether a human being or a machine was sending back the answers? If not, we would surely have to concede that the machine could be said to think. Turing predicted that this would happen within 50 years. In November 1991, a version of the Turing test was staged at the Computer Museum in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In the original question, he went on to say, can machines think? I believe to be too meaningless to deserve discussion. Well, we have nine years to go on Turing's prophecy, and as astonishing as this would no doubt seem to Descartes, Turing might well be proved correct. Now his rough estimate this was the first event in an annual competition with an ultimate prize of $100,000 for the first computer program which can persuade the judges that they're communicating with a human being. But whether that amount of memory is enough to support real thinking is another matter. Turing's original test was unrestricted. A judge could ask anything at all about any subject. The Cambridge version was heavily restricted. competition judges were confined to specialized topics to give existing computer programs a chance. Okay, tell me about the romantic problem between Heathcliff and Catherine uh, in the book Wuthering Heights. 
you like more things in the relationship than you dislike. I don't understand this response in the context of Wuthering Heights. What in particular is so hard to understand? It doesn't make sense to me, but I'll move on to a different question. Second grade school topics. Hello, I'm Laurie. Well, don't you have a pretty name? I guess you're pretty proud of it since uh, you keep on repeating it. What do you do in second grade? I do a lot of gymnastics. The winner was a program called Whimsical Conversation. Whimsical Conversation didn't just win. It was judged to be a human being by five out of the 10 judges. Wow. <laughs> Problems in interpersonal relationships was judged to be a human being by two judges. Second grade school topics was judged to be a human being by one judge. Uh, we have another 10 years to go, roughly speaking, before we'll know whether Turing's 50-year uh, prediction uh, is right or wrong. It's, I think, perfectly conceivable, it might actually happen that before the turn of the century, uh, a computer will pass the unrestricted Turing test. I rather doubt that it'll happen. I rather doubt that it'll ever happen. But not for uh, deep, interesting reasons, not because it's impossible in principle, but for m boring reasons of cost effectiveness. Uh, compare the task of passing the unrestricted Turing test to the task of making a robotic barn swallow that can fly around in a room, catch insects on the fly, and then land safely on a twig of an apple tree. I don't think anybody thinks that's in principle impossible but it would take billions of research and development to make this tiny robotic bird, and it wouldn't be much of a payoff. If what you want to know about is aerodynamics or ornithology, there are better ways of spending your research dollars. And I think the same thing is true about the, about the Turing test. Getting those last, that last 10% of verisimilitude, without which a human being will always unmask the computer, would have almost no theoretical interest. Uh, but would be terribly time-consuming. Back in 1950, Turing was using the Manchester computer to explore a new interest he had discovered in biology and cell differentiation. At the same time, he was heading for trouble. Well, in the post, there was this letter from Manchester, and it was from Alan, and it came, I may say, as a great surprise to me, because although I'd realised that, that he was gay, and indeed, one of his boyfriends was used to come to lectures with me. Um, I didn't know that he went picking up rough trade in the streets and getting involved with the police. So I was rather startled. Here's the letter. My dear Norman, I've now got myself into the kind of trouble that I've always considered to be quite a possibility for me, though I've usually rated it at about 10 to 1 against. I shall shortly be pleading guilty to a charge of sexual offences with a young man. The story of how it all came to be found out is a long and fascinating one, which I shall have to make into a short story one day, but I haven't time to tell you now. No doubt I shall emerge from it all a different man, but quite who I have not found out. I'm rather afraid that the following syllogism may be used by some in the future. Turing believes that machines think. Turing lies with men. Therefore, machines do not think. Yours in distress, Alan. Well, it was quite a story. In November 1951, Alan Turing finished his first big paper in mathematical biology, and he felt very proud and pleased at having got this out of the way. And I think it was then he decided to give himself a little bit of a, a break. And in December, he met a young man on the Oxford Road in Manchester, a chap called Arnold, who, uh, well, after a little bit of getting to know each other, Alan invited back to his house. And uh, there began a, a relationship, which had its uh, ups and downs, and there were difficulties in it. Arnold, unfortunately, had been rather boasting his relationship with this very impressive chap who told him about working on the electronic brain, all these things in Manchester University, and uh, had let a mate of his see Alan's address on a letter that he was sending to him. And this other chap, Harry, went and burgled Turing's house. 
And then there was the whole story about the, um, the police. He and his innocence, uh, because he was a total innocent, in his innocence went to the police when uh, 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 his young friend had said he perhaps knew who had done it, and said, oh, I know who's done it. And the police, of course, were interested in knowing how he got this information, and it was all uh, um, pulled out of him. Anybody more sophisticated and more, uh, more knowledge of the world would have realised that that was what was going to happen. He told me about it, and then and, and he complained a bit about the way the police tried to catch him out and so on. Then he said, well, you see, and then they, they made a transcript of our interview, and he said, of course, it was a total caricature, but it wasn't totally inaccurate. For example, he said, telling, I was having an affair with him. Question, what sort of an affair? Answer on the typescript. Swas on nerve, interquerval friction and mutual masturbation. <laughs> and telling, roared with laughter. <laughs> Well, Turing was certainly very averse to showing any kind of dishonesty or shame or anything else, anything other than clarity, if he could help it. And perhaps overcompensating for his little fib, uh, really made a very full statement about exactly what had happened between Ar him and Arnold. And after he'd done that, he had no choice. I mean, he was clearly guilty of all that he was charged with as a result. Turing had been given an OBE in recognition of his secret wartime work, though no one, of course, could say what it was for. He had also been consulted on occasion by British intelligence. Hugh Alexander, top scientific officer at GCHQ, appeared in camera as a character witness for Turing. He told me two things that amused me. One was that um, when he was talking to Turing beforehand, Turing brought out a file of everything he had about it, and on the on outside of the file, in large letters, burglary and buggery, because there'd been a burglary which had given rise to the uh, incident. And uh, the other thing was, he said to Alexander, uh, I probably got the figures wrong, but the, the, rel rel the relativity is correct. He said, you know, the worst I can get for what I've done is seven years, but if I'd buggered a sheep, it might be ten. And he cackled. <laughs> he had to have psychological treatment, I believe, and certainly he had to have hormone therapy. And I well remember him describing to me with giggles the effect that it was having on him, namely it was causing him to grow breasts. When he was convicted of homosexuality, um, this put him beyond the pale as far as government employment in secret work was concerned because, of course, they'd always bothered about um, blackmail, that sort of thing. And uh, you wouldn't get a PV certificate, positive vetting certificate, if you were a convicted uh, or even thought to be a homosexual. The whole ordeal seems to have left Turing unrepentant. In 1953, he went on holiday in Norway, where he'd heard there were dances for men only. He was now under police surveillance. My dear Norman, thanks for your letter. I should have answered it earlier. I have a delightful story to tell you of my adventurous life when we next meet. I've had another round with the gendarme, and it's round two to Turing. Half the police of northern England, by one report, were out searching for a supposed boyfriend of mine. It was all a mare's nest. Perfect virtue and chastity had governed all our proceedings. But the poor sweeties never knew this. A very light kiss beneath a foreign flag under the influence of drink was all that had ever occurred. Being on probation, my shining virtue was terrific and had to be. If I had so much as parked my bicycle on the wrong side of the road, there might have been 12 years for me. No time to write about logic now, love, Alan. Turing spent more and more time at home, working hard on mathematical biology. No one who knew him was prepared for what happened next. It was the 8th of June, 1954. At about five o'clock in the afternoon, Alan Turing's housekeeper came here with shopping to cook his dinner. And she saw immediately something very strange. All the lights in the house were on. She went in, went upstairs to find him, and there he was, dead in bed. 
He must have died during the holiday weekend. There was a strong chemical smell in the room, which was later identified as, as cyanide. And by his bedside, there was a half-eaten apple. Some people have suspected that the Secret Service may have at least encouraged him to commit suicide, and that there's even a slight suspicion, apparently, in some circles, that they, they might have contrived to murder him on the grounds that he was too big a security risk, that he knew so much, and yet he would go abroad to see some young man. I could imagine them being quite nervous about that. But somehow it seems to me to be far-fetched. Turing's mother never accepted the official verdict. There was no suicide note, he was notoriously careless, and he had been amusing himself with a chemistry experiment involving potassium cyanide. His mother wrote to me, and she said that although it was a verdict of suicide, she believed in accident. And of course, um, his method was chosen to make it possible for some, at least, to believe that. I mean, you're interested in the reason for his suicide. And some people say it's because he was totally bored with being watched by the police. But I have a feeling it was tied up with his knowledge that mathematics is a young man's game, and that in his mid-40s, which I think he was, um, he was never going to make another earth-shaking discovery like his famous computable numbers. A lot of people, of course, want to try and trace reasons. Why did you do that? Now, I think it's an insult to human beings to suppose that one can write out reasons for everything they do. I should be very annoyed if someone tried to explain my conduct <laughs> in, in terms of a series of logical steps. People do inexplicable things. I think it's important to remember that. But the second thing was, I, I did already know that he had discussed ways of committing suicide with two other people I knew. They said, they both said, well, we weren't sure whether this was just a... Uh, an interesting intellectual exercise, or whether it was something serious. Well, it, it turned out that this went back a long way, and obviously the suicidal impulse was something which came up every now and then. Alan Turing was cremated on the 12th of June, 1954, and his ashes scattered in the gardens of Woking Crematorium. There is no memorial. I suppose that the reason that so many of us have a fascination for creating intelligence within a machine is it gets, in a very basic way, it gets at what we are. It gets at what's important about us. And in a way, I guess it has the potential of kind of freeing us from the constraints of our, our physical, fleshy bodies. I mean, I think it's terrible that I'm going to be dead 100 years from now. I mean, that's, that's fundamentally unfair. And I can think of 2,000 years of stuff I want to do. And at the end of that, I'm sure there'd be another 2,000 years and so on. And I love to somehow outlive my body. Now, people have different ways of imagining doing that. I mean, some people write books, and some people have children. But in a sense, I guess this is, this is another kind of children. I mean, the idea that, that you could put something that was alive and learning and loving in some kind of a body that could last much longer than we do, that you've somehow freed yourself from this kind of short-term meat body and maybe, maybe reached out to something farther, something, something more important and longer. <laughs>